It's funny because I guess this guy had a uh, an unalive squad. It's just funny to me when I see these people that are known to be so ruthless and so um, terrifying and so evil and, and so bad and when they get popped off, they just be falling apart and shit. <laughs> Tigre que fueron más fuertes, por favor. Tigre. Tigre que fueron. 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 <laughs> oh, girl is laying on thick, boy. She's like, come on, man. See, those things be the ironies for me. Those are the things that I see, the things that I think about. When, when people are in these positions, right? People with reputations. When they're in these positions and, the, and they need a glass of water, I think to some, the, myself, have they ever deprived somebody of a glass of water? It's like the world becomes revisionist history. Did you ever deprive somebody of water when you thirsty? <laughs> <laughs> they have a ball. He needs a fix. So what? Do do strung out or something? What's up? Y'all know? Is everybody over there strung out? Maybe that's a question I need to ask the twins. <laughs> We got fountains, and gazebos. Ruben said they lit for sure, right? Yeah, all of them, super lit. Got to to do what you do. Estas capacidades han permitido un combate sin precedente. He was thirsty. I wonder if he's ever if he's ever denied somebody water. <laughs> Me <laughs> 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 We saw him needing a drink of water. Get that boy some milk. Get that boy some milk. Segment one, note. In lieu of the pending trial of Gennaro Garcia Luna, I want to share some observations and events related to GGL. We're going to call him GGL. See, this guy knows what he's doing. I'm with you, Bugs. We're going to call him GGL too. Not to be mistaken with BBL. GGL, Gennaro Garcia Luna, all right? Uh, events related to GGL. Borderland Beat was already tracking the collusion of GGL starting around 2001 when GGL served in the newly created agency, uh, Federal Agency of Investigation, Agencia Federal de Investigación, AFI, under Mexican President Vicente Fox Quesada. GGL would go on to serve in the Federal Cabinet of President Felipe Calderon as Secretary of Public security. <laughs> Salutes to you, Ruben Contreras. Look at this guy wearing his double suits. This is definitely going to make it on the cover of my video. Look at dude. Looking crazy. All right? GGL was arrested on December 9th, 2019 by federal agents in Dallas, Texas. He is presently pending trial in the Eastern District of New York to face charges of engaging in a continuing criminal enterprise. It is alleged that Garcia Luna received multi-million dollar bribes from the Sinaloa cartel in exchange for permitting the Sinaloa cartel to operate with impunity in Mexico. As alleged, for nearly two decades, that's a lot of paper, two decades, 
GGL betrayed those he was sworn to protect by accepting bribes from members of the Sinaloa cartel to facilitate their crimes and empower their criminal enterprise, stated acting United States Attorney Ducharme. Douche. If convicted of the continuing criminal enterprise charge, GGL could face a mandatory minimum sentence of 20 years imprisonment and a maximum of life in prison. So this is like, uh, you know, somebody in the cabinet of the, the, you know, the president in the United States just gets popped off for letting people slide on everything. But he was the corruption that we're always talking and looking for and that people tell us doesn't exist at the highest states of government. Not to mention beyond them to the richest family these countries have ever seen. And the reason they've been rich for so long is because they've been stepping on necks for a long time. Some people don't believe that. Some people do. Felipe de Jesus Calderón Hinojoso, a conservative Mexican politician, served as the president of Mexico from December 2006 to November 2012. As a member of the National Action Party, Partido Acción Nacional, PAN, for 30 years, he made the issue of organized crime the central part of his campaign for president. When he took office in 2006, he wasted no time taking the Mexican cartels head on. He dismantled the Tijuana cartel on the border of California, the cartel del Golfo on the Gulf Coast, La Familia Micoacana, this was personal, as Calderón was from Micoacan, in the Tierra Caliente region and almost decimated the very powerful Juarez cartel. Calderón had entrusted his right-hand man and personal friend, GGL, to accomplish this task. He had appointed GGL as Secretary of Public Security in his cabinet. So he's a Homeland Security guy. GGL started by rebuilding the federal police force that began operating in June 2009 under a new police model. Felipe Calderón, president, beefed up the federal police and changed their role to strictly take on the cartels. They became a huge nation nationwide tactical unit operating in hotspots around the country. Under President Vicente Fox, from 2000 to 2006, there were 11,989 federal police. Under Presidente Felipe Calderón, the number of federal police officers was increased to 34,846. Damn. This was in addition to the Mexican military that also played a key role in taking on the cartels. So they went from 12,000 police to 35,000 police, plus they had military. Ganga. They were on some we're going to fight shit. All with their faces covered. Again, on both sides of the fence, there is no lack of young people that are willing to die over these silly causes that cost so many people so much. Calderon kept Garcia Luna very close in his circle of trusted politicians. Garcia Luna was considered untouchable and was Calderon's favorite cabinet member. Yes, Calderon managed to keep his campaign promise. He had all the criminal cartels in Mexico hard, except for one. There was a little secret that was starting to pop its ugly head. There were very credible rumors that Garcia Luna was colluding with organized crime, specifically the Cartel del Pacifico, under the very command of Ismael Zambada Garcia El Mayo. The group was mainly composed of the Beltran Leyva brothers, that were based in the Mexican state of Morelos. On October 19, 2008, GGL was traveling from Cuernavaca to Tepotzlan with an escort of 27 armed bodyguards. Damn, what? 27? 26 wasn't enough? 20, we had to... All right. His escort was intercepted by approximately 10 armored suburban vehicles carrying a large commando of heavily armed sicarios. GGL ordered his bodyguards to stand down and comply with the directions given by the sicarios. The bodyguards were stripped, stripped of their weapons and were blindfolded. They were not just concerned for the dignitary they were supposed to protect, but for their own safety. Some of the bodyguards overheard one of the sicarios yell at GGL, this is the first and last warning. So that you know that we can reach you anytime we want. If you do not comply with the mutual agreement we forged. So they had pressure. It is said that the voice came from Arturo Beltran Leiva. A top lieutenant for the cartel that's in the lower. 
GGL left with Beltran Leva, abandoning his escort to their fa- his escorts to their fate. <laughs> the bodyguards did now know where GGL went and what he did during those four long hours. He was away meeting with Arturo Beltran Leva. When GGL returned, the sicarios returned the weapons to the bodyguards and they pro- proceeded with the escort of Garcia Luna. The bodyguards, who were professionally trained to protect dignitaries and high-level politicians, felt humiliated. I bet. They signed up for a different life. They probably could have just as easily signed up to be on the other side of that gang war, right? But instead, they were like, oh, I'm a soldier. I'm a bodyguard. I'm going to protect these dignitaries. Now he's over there working for the guy that he thought he was working against. The bodyguards narrated the details of the event in a letter sent to the legislators of the Senate in order to expose what they say was how dangerous it is to grant more power to the SSP, Secretaria de Seguridad Pública, or Secretariat of Public Safety. Under the control of GGL, a good portion of the high-level officials of the SSP were at the service of drug traffickers. According to the investigations carried out by the Office of the Assistant Attorney General for Specialized Investigations in Organized Crime, Siedo, many of the officials closest to Garcia Luna seem to be corrupted by drug traffickers. So it wasn't just him, there was a whole little rat pack. Under the watch of Calderon administration, under the watch of the Calderon administration, evidence started to emerge that the SSP was one of the institutions most infiltrated by the Sinaloa cartel and other criminal organizations. So they were basically a little cartel amongst themselves inside the government. In 2010, Zambada did an interview with Julio Sherrill Garcia of Proceso Magazine. He criticized the government's efforts to take him down, saying it was little too late if the goal was to hurt the drug trade. Quote, the problem with the narco business is that it involves millions of dollars. How do you dominate that? Zambala said. As for the bosses, locked up, dead or extradited, their replacements are already standing by. The government's drug war, he said, is already lost. <laughs> That's huge. Your attempts are futile. These bosses that you guys become fans of and that people... Be like, oh, that's my guy. I'm on his side. Not only do we got they got all kind of weird skeletons in their closets, but they're there for a good time, not a long time. You know what I'm saying? Mind you, some ruthlessly stay real, real long time. But as you can see, even at the top, he's basically saying, hey, Chapo's out the door. He's extra, he's extradited. He's he's popped off. He's locked up. Or this one or that one. Whatever. You see, buddy over there with the gold with the gold desert eagle with diamonds on it. Dude over there. That's the guy. He's the next guy. We're not worried about what you're talking about. Why lost? The nar- quote, the narcotics trade and everything that goes along with it are inside the society. It is deeply rooted in corruption. It always has. El Mayo is the last powerful boss of the old guard. All the others have been either, all the others have either died or are in prison. There are not many pictures that have been made public of Mayo Zambada. And Mayo has managed to avoid capture by keeping a low profile and by corrupting the Mexican government at the highest level. Members of organized crime in Mexico spend millions of dollars to corrupt government officials. These criminal organizations see this as an investment in their drug trafficking enterprise. It is the price of doing business in Mexico. The expensive bribes they pay gets them protection, access to, to sensitive information, targeting of rival cartels, and assistance to move their drugs north. Let's say you sold your soul to the cartel. You're like, yo, I'm about this life. I'm going to go out in a blaze. It's going down. I'm going to get some money. I'm going to get me an army. I'm going to hold it down for these old men. These old men going to love me the way I cartel. I'm a cartel hard. You know what I'm saying? And he gives his life to the game, right? And he's like, yeah, I'm ready for these fools. And he starts making some money, right? Boom, yeah, man, he's loyal to, he's loyal to the dudes at the top, the viejitos at the top with the trucker hats, right? He's loyal to them. He's like, yeah, I'm going to go all out for these fools. I'm going to go get me an army, get me an army, give me some jewels, give me some chicks. All right, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to throw big parties, right? 
And then he's like, but but he's loyal, right? And then and then what happens? The dude he's loyal to look at him and say, look at this asshole with his big diamond Cuban link chains and his imported women. And why he got so many gunners over there, huh? Why he got so many bodies? What's he doing? He's building an army? Is he trying to threaten my empire? Is he trying to push me out? He's just thinking, this guy's a threat to my power. And what does he do? Wipes him out. Absorbs his army and his chicks. In 2008, people started to notice that Felipe Calderon's government was not targeting the Sinaloa cartel as he was other cartels. High-level leaders of the Sinaloa cartel had to be sacrificed to give a perception that Sinaloa was not being favored. It's believed that several high-ranking members of the Sinaloa cartel had to be what? Surrendered. It's the game that they play. It's the game that they play. You see it in movies and you think it's not real, it's real. They need a scapegoat. Who are we going to serve up to the police? Okie and Doki. Send them over there. Bet. They pick their Okie Dokes. Dude in government that's on the take, he looks good because he done got him some high-level guys. He didn't get shit. He got some shit they handed over. Then people screaming, oh, it's a rat. He's a rat. <laughs> no, he was a, he was a pawn on a chessboard, and they used him. That's what it is. Everything is not cut and dry. But in that game, that's what it is. It said that Ignacio Nacho Coronel Villarreal, Alfredo Beltran Leiva, El Mocomo, and Gonzalo Inzunza, Inzunza, El Macho Prieto, were a few high level. They got to stop with these fucking names. There was 30 names right there. There was only three people, four people. 30 names right there. Were a few high level couples that were surrendered by the Sinaloa Syndicate, except... The arrest of El Mocomo caused major problems for the CDS and the federal government. Now, that's where everything went crazy right there. The war started on a Monday, January 21st, 2008. On board, on board Hummer vehicles and with heavy artillery, more than 300 elements of the Special Forces Aeromobile Group, GAFE, of the Mexican Army positioned themselves in the area of a residence located in the Burocratas community in Culiacán, Sinaloa. An anonymous call had told them that the youngest of the Beltran, Beltran brothers, Alfredo, alias El, El Mocomo, was waiting at that address for a shipment of money on an outstanding settlement from some of his Colombian associates. Near dawn, a gate opened. A white BMW van came out with four men on board. The team of elite military commandos blocked their way. The men in the vehicle surrendered without firing a single shot. Inside the, vi inside the vehicle was El Mocomo. While inside the house, military officials recovered $900,000, 11 expensive watches, an AK-47, and eight handguns. They had nothing going on in there. And the news of the arrest of El Mocomo was presented as the most important arrest carried out by the government in the war against drug trafficking that Felipe Calderon had carried out. El Mocomo would be extradited to the U.S. The arrest of El Mocomo caused immediate panic from federal police agencies that were receiving bribes to protect the Beltran Labor Brothers. So these guys are supposed to keep these guys out of jail. They get money for it every month. They've been eating off of this for years. All of a sudden, dudes in jail. Houston, we have a problem. The arrest of El Mocomo caused immediate panic from federal police agencies that were receiving bribes to protect the Beltran Labor Brothers, the BLO led by the Beltran Labor Brothers, had corrupted the highest level of that federal institution by paying monthly bribes of between $150,000 and $450,000. These bribes were supposed. These bribes were supposed to see. This is, shit is spelled wrong. These bribes were supposed supposed to ensure that officials of the highest level were to provide leaks of sensitive information to the BLO. The day of El Mocomo's arrest, several high-ranking officials were very nervous. They had received reports that El Mocomo was going to be arrested by the military but could do nothing to avoid it. They expected the leadership of Arturo Beltran to call them to explain why Al Alfredo was arrested. Hector Beltran Leiva, El Ache, was upset when El with El Grande over the arrest of his brother Alfredo Beltran Leiva. Sergio Enrique Villarreal Barragán, El Grande, God damn, 
El Grande was a former Mexican federal police officer who worked as a lieutenant for Arturo Beltran Leyva. Again, he was a cop, another cop. He got his name El Grande, the big one, because he's six foot seven inches tall. Uh, El Grande was extradited to the United States on May 23rd, 2012, and may possibly be serving as a protective witness for the DNA. And when it's possibly and they don't know, it's pretty much the case. Although El Grande was not directly responsible for the security of El Mocomo, he oversaw the cartel relationship with the federal government and the arrest caused suspicion for El Grande. Hector Beltran was resting at his home in Morelos when he was told about the arrest of El Mocomo and became so upset that he took out a firearm from inside his waist and started shooting up to the ceiling while his escort looked on very nervous. He smashed a bottle of wine that was on top of a table against a European table that had been a gift from the Panista governor, Marco Antonio Adame Castillo. Hector Beltran requested the immediate presence of his most trusted man, El Grande. He was brought in all the way from Puebla in a helicopter from the state police of Morelos. So he could just send, he could just send the state police to go pick your ass up. Just think about that. That's the shit that uh, Crenshaw was surprised of. Like, he sent the police to pick you up. Yeah, they just... Call your local, hey, uh, I need you to go scoop buddy up. But let, put the helicopter on top of his bedroom and get him in a helicopter and bring him here. Uh, with his eyes red from anger and anguish, Hector Beltran Leva requested a quick explanation why his brother was arrested. He reminded El, El, El Grande about the millions of dollars in bribes that the cartel paid to ensure the protection of his family from many levels of the government. There was a clear understanding that his family would not be touched. Hector Beltran requested that El, Gra El Grande conduct a complete, thorough investigation to find out who they had to kill. El Grande started making phone calls to his contacts with the PGR. He spoke with Captain Fernando Rivera of the PGR. He arranged for a meeting in the city of Mexico to get the information on the arrest Alfredo Beltran Leiva in Culiacán. El Grande told him that Arturo Beltran Leva was pissed off, very pissed off. Captain Rivera promised to give him a detailed report of the operation no later than the next day. The next day, Captain Rivera met with El Grande in a restaurant on Avenida Reforma and the captain was also in the company of commanders Menton Celia and Roberto Garcia. Rivera ordered the commanders to gather the information immediately in less than 24 hours. El Grande was given the names of supposed snitches. Rivera told El Grande that from 11 o'clock onwards, the special forces of the army would no longer be present and that only 11 agents at a federal investigation agency, AFI, would remain on the scene to provide security. He told El Grande that with the delivery of 1 million pesos for AFIs, as well as 3 million that would be to pay off Fernando Rivera and his people, it would be possible to get the cooperation of the security detail and allow an armored truck to break into the gate to give them access to the facility. So they trying to, what, break them out? What are we talking about here? After El Grande gave the information to his boss, Hector Beltran ordered El Grande to take immediate action to rescue his detained brother. El Grande gathered about 100 men that came from different parts of the country to the city of Mexico to carry out an assault of the headquarters where El Mocomo was being held. They were going to break him out, huh? Culiacanazo style. But El Grande ran into some problems. The top bosses of the Beltran Labor clan, Joaquin Guzman Loera El Chapo and Ismael El Mayo Zambada, refused to authorize the rescue attempt. I wonder why. Can anybody guess? Because <laughs> this was a betrayal. They explained that the conditions were not right for a rescue attempt. They further explained that Mokomo would have would have to be sacrificed. The assault had been planned for midnight on January 24th, but in the end, it did not take place because El Mokomo was transferred to the federal prison, Puente Grande. The refusal of El Chapo and El Mayo to help secure the freedom of Alfredo Beltran prompted bad blood between the brothers. Between the Beltran, blah, 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 Beltran brothers. This caused the breakup of the two factions. This would be the start of the bloody war between the BLO and the Sinaloa cartel. 
This is when El Grande brought up the notion that perhaps the people responsible for the arrest of El Mocomo were attributed to El Chapo Guzman and Mayo Zambada. It is believed that in the drug trafficking business where there is a blood alliance, it is virtually indestructible. El Mocomo was married to a cousin of El Chapo, but Arturo, but Arturo Beltran felt that blood alliance had been broken. And guess what? We know that those alliances break easier than we think. All you got to do is look at Juancho. I don't know if his last name was Guzman, but Juancho was his cousin. And he knew he was betraying Chapo and Chapo was betraying him and it all ended bad. So from now on, he was going to have to be killed or arrested for he did not care anymore the consequences. El Chapo and El Mayo knew that this would result in a war with the BLO, but they accepted the risk. They just wanted to move on. They either did not want to bring heat from the federal government, or perhaps they were working on another angle with the top levels of the federal government or both. Then, there was the rumor that El Chapo had made a deal with the highest levels of the federal government that he would deliver El Mocomo in exchange for the release of his son, El Chapito. It's a very selfish, lonely game out there, boy. <laughs> you could talk all the family loyalty, should have held them down, shit. People are throwaway in this business. This is, uh, people are disposable in this business. This is, there's a lot of betrayal going on in there. So it's like when people pick sides and pick and choose who's the rat, who's the snitch, who stood 10 toes. Well, you got to sift through the PDF files. You got to sniff through the, you got to sift through the betrayals. You got to sift through all of it. So, boom. Then there was the rumor that El Chapo had made a deal with the highest levels of the federal government that he would deliver El Mocomito, I mean El Mocomo, in exchange for the release of his son, El Chapito. At the end of April 2008, the same month that El Chapito was released, a shootout occurred in Culiacán. A house which allegedly belonged to the children of Arturo Beltran was targeted by elements of the federal police, supported by municipal police. They used the police for everything. God damn. Five Sicarios and two ministerial police agents were killed during a fierce battle. Arturo Beltran accused the feds of serving as an armed wing for El Chapo and ordered his people to kill any federal police officer whenever they were found. He placed narcomantas in which he wrote, Policemen, soldiers, so that it is clear to you, El Mocomo continues to reign. Atención. Arturo Beltran Leiva, and also wearing soldiers, little federal police forces. This place is the territory of Arturo Beltran. They send messages loud and clear, boy, loud and clear. Arturo Beltran accused the feds. Uh, no, we did. We just did that. By the end of April 2008, there was blood running down the streets of Culiacan after the demons were unleashed causing a string of confrontations that in a month alone resulted in 1,156 executions. People are disposable in that business and the way it's handled. 1,156 executions, just people was just nothing. You just throw them away, throw them on a pyre and burn them up. It's crazy. Arturo Beltran assassinated the regional director of the PFP, Edgar Eusebio Milan. Milan was ambushed and killed when he arrived at his parents' house in a building located in a community in Guerrero, although only a handful of people had access to the itinerary of Milan, the information was leaked from within the PFP to the BLO. The real revenge for Arturo Beltran came on May 8, 2008. Five SUVs loaded with sicarios surrounded a vehicle carrying Edgar Guzman, another son of El Chapo, in a parking lot in Culiacán, Sinaloa. Edgar Guzman was unalived. 500 gunshots were fired along with a grenade deployed from a grenade launcher in addition to the execution of Edgar. A nephew of the drug trafficker Cesar Luera was also killed. In Culiacán, the evil rage was unleashed. The local media did not dare report the news. Think about that. The news don't even want to report what happened. The news ain't the news when it's their news. They're <laughs> not uh, 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 that. Don't talk about it. The whole build, news building will come down. In Culiacan, the evil rage was unleashed. The local media did not dare report the news. They only did it two days later, attributing the information to newspapers and news agencies in Mexico City. 
Borderland Beat was the place where some information could be obtained. The blood of the son of El Chapo was still fresh on the ground when the cries from the leader of the Sinaloa cartel pledged that he would erase the name of Arturo Beltran from the face of the earth. Sorry, papas, that didn't happen. The murder of El Chapo's son was part of the same M.O. that unalived the police chief Milian. Milian had been the brain of the Secretary of Public Security, GGL, in many anti-drug operations. His death caused a change in the upper level of the structure of the PFP. Gennaro Garcia Luna replaced Milan with an old friend with whom he had collaborated closely while working with the AFI. It was Geraldo Garay, Garay. But as things happen in Mexico from time to time, Garay only lasted a few months in that position. Garay was accused of serving two masters, the Beltran cartel and that of El Mayo Zambada. A judge ordered him to be formally apprehended in October 2008. December 2009... Inspector Edgar Enrique Vallaldo, who was a protected witness, was unalived at a Starbucks in Mexico City after he had confessed of colluding with organized crime by allowing infiltrations to the agency, tapping telephone calls to benefit specific cartels, allowing cartel operators to interrogate captured adversaries, and then presenting the arrestees as... Achievements of the PFP. All right. They were turning people over to the police. Play games if you want to. The Letter of La Barbie by Bugs for Borderland Beat, segment three. In the last segment, we touched a little on Alfredo Beltran Leiva, El Mocomo, and El Grande. I'm not going through his 30 names again. Who were both extradited to the U.S. Both have a lot of knowledge about corruption with the Mexican government and could link... Well, could sink GGL during his, his trial if they chose to testify against him. It is believed that El Grande is possibly a protected witness and most likely will testify in the trial of Garcia Luna. Today we will talk about another high-level capo, La Barbie. Edgar Valdez Villarreal La Barbie is a U.S. citizen and was a high-ranking lieutenant of the once powerful criminal cartel, the Beltran Labor Organization. Valdez was born and raised in Laredo, Texas, and his nickname, La Barbie, was derived due to his white skin, blue eyes, and facial features. La Barbie was the leader of the security detail of Arturo Beltran Leiva. La Barbie managed to corrupt high-level officials of the government of former President Felipe Calderón, who are accused of having links with the Sinaloa cartel and the Beltran Labor Organization. It was revealed through Mexican journalist Anabel Hernandez that La Barbie was an informant for the DEA and the FBI in the United States, while at the same time, he was a participant in the corruption of Calderón. In essence, La Barbie was described in U.S. court documents as a two-sided coin with the same face. <laughs> There's people right now that will argue for this man in the chat. Argue, for, I mean, not in the chat, in the comments. Argue for this man. He was the strongest, the biggest, the... He was a f***ing informant on both sides of the fence. During and before the video, we just saw them snatching him up. He was a collaborator with officials of the government of Felipe Calderon who are allegedly providing confidential information to the Sinaloa cartel and BLO. The information leaked to organized crime included the identities, photographs, and locations of DE. So he was playing both sides. He was a double agent. Uh, Might have been a triple agent. Either way, he wasn't agent enough to save himself. And that's why right now he's wearing a mask somewhere like Nicky Barnes telling stories. The information leaked to organized crime included the identities, photographs, and locations of DEA agents who were working undercover in numerous parts of the Mexican territory, thus putting their lives at risk. In 2009, the federal Mexican government of Felipe Calderon turned against the BLO and started to dismantle the organization. Mexican police raided his rental homes where they located grenades, automatic weapons, and police uniforms. In June 2010... La Barbie was indicted in the U.S. court on charges of trafficking thousands of kilos of cocaine from Mexico into the U.S. It is believed he was trafficking about one ton of cocaine per month. 
On August 30th, 2010, La Barbie was arrested by Mexican federal police in Mexico City. On September 30th, 2015, he was extradited to the USA. In June of 2018, he was sentenced to 49 years in a U.S. federal prison. That's a lot. In November of 2022, Borderland Beat was the first to report that La Barbie was no longer listed in federal prison custody. The website of the Federal Bureau of Prisons listed him as a not in BOP custody. That means he's talking to grand juries all over this grand country. There was speculation that perhaps he was set free. I am certain that is not the case. La Barbie is most likely housed in an undisclosed facility and with full protection as he will most likely play a central role in the trial against Garcia Luna. GGL. The U.S. government has a vested interest in ensuring that nothing happens to their star witness. Borderland Beat has known for years of the corruption between these cartels and the Mexican government, but not until his arrest by Mexican authorities that he was ready to talk. In November of 2012, LaBarbie wrote a letter. Below is full text of the letter delivered on November 27, 2012 to Grupo Reforma, and subsequently made public. The letter was also sent to journalist Anabel Hernandez. Here's the letter. I want to state first that I, did, that I did not agree to take part in the protected witness program. Likewise, I categorically deny the accusations and statements made by the arresting governmental agencies regarding the manner in which my detention was carried out and that the truth of the facts is the following. My arrest was the result of a political persecution by President Felipe Calderón. Calderón initiated an attack against me because I refused to form part of the agreement that Mr. Calderón wanted to have with all the organized crime groups. He personally held several meetings to have talks with various groups of organized crime. He personally held several meetings to have talks with various groups of organized crime. Subsequently, numerous meetings were held through General Mario Arturo Acosta Chaparro, who met by order of the president and Juan Camilo Mourinho, with two of the leaders of the family Micoacana. Later, the general also met in Matamorros with Heriberto Lascano, El Lasca, and Miguel Angel Trevino, El Z40, leader of Los Zetas. Sometime later, Acosta Chaparro and Mourinho met with Arturo Beltran Leiva, El Balbas, leaders of the Beltran, Le uh, the BLO, and also met with El Chapo Guzman, leader of the Sinaloa cartel. So he's, Calderon wanted to forge agreements with all of the cartels, Los Zetas, the Gulf cartel, me, the Juarez cartel, Vicente and Mayo and Chapo, Sinaloa cartel. Since he did not receive a response from me, and because I did not want to have collaborations with any other criminal groups, Calderon initiated a, di and a directed persecution against me. He ordered several searches of my home without a legal warrant. They stole money, jewelry, cars, as well as numerous other belongings. So he's not just putting it on, on GGL, he's putting that shit on the El Presidente. GGL, head of the Federal Public Security Secretariat since at least 2002, first in the AFI and then in the PFP, received money from me in various occasions as a, result, as a result of drug trafficking and having knowledge it was coming from organized crime. A select group that included Armando Espinosa de Benito, who was collaborating with the DEA and provided me sensitive information. Other government officials that received money from me were Luis Calderas Palomino, Elgar, Eusebio, Milan Gomez, Francisco, have 70 fucking names. I can't do it. I'm not doing it. Among them, they claimed that they were tasked in arresting me in some operation. But in reality, they had the instructions to kill me. At the time of my arrest, which was carried out at my home, as reported by the media, I was alone. We saw you use thirsty. They say I was arrested without firing a single gunshot on that day. But the truth was, there was gunfire. A federal policeman who was... The same one who took me in custody urged me to run so that he could shoot me and be able to claim that he was repelling an attack. They intended to kill me just like they did to Aron Arturo Hines Becerril. Hines Becerril was killed in the vicinity of the Perisul Shopping Center. 
He was shot numerous times in the back on the same day I was arrested. So what if 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 the video that we just saw when he was like he was thirsty and they were like let's take him over there so he feels better. They were walking him off field style. What if they made him run dance? You know what I'm saying? Start busting at him. It's quite possible. I mean, they're a gang too. I mean, there's no difference between them and him. They was hoping he died at the thirst there. You know? Everything was covered up by the PF. It is worth mentioning that despite the background of GGL, who was looking at numerous criminal charges, and of which the American government is already aware of, was directly involved, they even have knowledge of other issues that were talked about during the review of the Merida Initiative. I already have access to the most recent testimony of the collaboration of protected witnesses, witness Mateo Sergio Villarreal, that is being held by Presidente Felipe Calderon without criminal charges being brought against him prior to his extradition. It should be noted that in all the arrests made by the federal police, nothing is confiscated as evidence. Everything is stolen. Money, watches, vehicles, drugs, I believe that. None of that shit's put in a little plastic bag and stored in evidence locker. That chain of custody don't exist. Them Rolexes is somebody's crib. It is necessary to point out that both the Mexican Army and the Secretary of the Navy tend to be more honest. They detain who they are supposed to, and make them available to the proper authorities. I could have easily done what they do. But they, the Mexican government public officials, I mentioned are also part of the criminal structure of this country. Signed, Edgar Valdez Villarreal. He said, they are part of the criminal structure of this country. Them, us, same thing. Whose betrayal is worse? The criminal tells you he's the criminal, right? The government tells you they're your savior and then they... Put the noose around your neck.